I'm really excited about what the Father has to share with us this week. The title of this week's Torah portion is Vayigash, and it's translated as, and he drew near. But as I began to look at this particular Torah portion, and by the way, there are so many things that are powerful, amazing shadow pictures. And to be honest, David and John were already all over them the past two weeks and the portions leading up to this, because this is all about something that the Father is doing with his house, with his people, and there has to be a unity that takes place. The people have to become unified in order to do what they've been called to do. Amen? But the amazing thing is that the background of this unification that takes place, it happens, it doesn't happen during times of plenty. How many of you realize that? It doesn't happen when everything's going great. It happens in the midst of the famine. It happens in the midst when there's extreme devastation covering the known world and the, the earth has become gripped with the famine that then all of a sudden, guess what? Me and you working together because we've been given the same word, we've been given the same vision, all of a sudden that becomes quite important now because you begin to realize I can't accomplish this without you and vice versa, amen? And so we're going to look at this concept of the purpose of the famine, and whenever I began to look at this idea of the famine, it was quite interesting to me because maybe you realize it, maybe you don't. Every single one of the patriarchs went through a famine. And when we begin to look at this and we understand the spiritual implications as well, my goodness, how could the ones that were given a promise, the ones that were given a vision, the ones that were called and chosen, they had to go through a time of famine. And so as we begin to look at this, we're going to begin to delve into this question, what's the purpose of the famine? Is there something that's expected of you and I in the midst of it? Is there something we're supposed to learn in the midst of it? And as we continue to look at this, Vayigash, and he drew near, is the title. It covers Genesis chapter 44, verse 18, through chapter 47, verse 27. And as we already stated, it provides for us the details of the reunification of Joseph with his brothers. And we find that the family is settled at Goshen in the land of Egypt. And as you look at this entire passage, it's extremely prophetical and it's extremely powerful. And it begins to show us how this reunification of the two branches of Joseph and Judah would take place. But the amazing thing is, is that Joseph plays a dual role here. Not only does Joseph represent the brother, Joseph, but we also understand that Joseph now stands in the position as a shadow picture and a type of the Messiah. And we begin to find insight in the days ahead when the famine comes, which by the way, there's another famine well on its way. When the famine comes, the way that Israel survives is by drawing near to the one that's able to preserve them. Amen? Amen. And so we find that as we're going to look at this, our focus is going to be on this event that causes this reunion, the famine. But first, we're going to take a quick look at the title of this Torah portion. As we look at this Torah portion title, it's titled Vayigash, and it comes from the root word Nagash, and it means to draw near, to approach a sense of intimacy. But it's quite interesting because when we read this Torah portion, we understand, as John already alluded to, it's about Judah drawing near to Joseph, but yet we understand there's something bigger taking place here. But as I began to look at this word in the Hebrew, how many of you realize from the English, when we think of drawing near, that's, that's the end of the concept, okay, we drew near, we came close, it's this time of intimacy. But the Hebrew word, not only can it mean to draw near, but it can also mean to allow space for to recede in order to give space for something. How many of you realize that if you intend on drawing near to Yahweh, if you intend on having that intimate walk with him, if that's your goal, if that's your purpose, then the very language itself begins to teach us the way you draw near is that you have to first learn to make space for him. You must first learn to recede, to decrease so that he might increase. And it's no accident that as we look at this Torah portion, we know that where is Israel sent to survive the famine? They are planted in Goshen. Goshen is spelled with the exact same letters as this word Nagash, meaning to draw near. Israel is sent to the place where they must learn to decrease, where they must learn to withdraw and make space for the one in order to be intimate with him. 
And as I begin to look at this, we find this becomes the foundation, the overarching theme of what's taking place in the midst of this famine. And it was quite interesting to me because the famine, a lot of times, if you're believers, we think, well, we have the word. We have the seed, we have the blessings, we have the promises, and so that famine's not going to affect you and I, right? Because we have the word, we have that. And yet we find throughout the scriptures again and again, and we're gonna look at these examples, the believers, the ones that are the patriarchs of the faith, they went through a season of famine. And the season of famine was not before they were given a promised word, it was after. And so we have to ask ourselves, my goodness, is there a lesson here then? Could our first clue be, be being given to us that these seasons of famine are all about us as a people and as an individual learning how even if we've been given a word, if we've been given a promise, it's teaching you, you still, in order to see that promise produce, in order to see that promise made manifest in your life, there's a season where you're going to have to learn to draw near. There's a season where you're going to have to learn to decrease self in order that he might, might increase. There's going to be a season when you're given a promised word that if you're ever going to learn to handle it correctly, you're going to have to go through a difficult time and learn what it means to draw near. Amen? And so as we begin to look at this, it was amazing because we're talking about Israel, the chosen nation, the ones that are walking in covenant. They are sent to Goshen in order to learn to draw near. Now, to have a proper foundation concerning these shadow pictures that we're going to look at, we got to have an understanding regarding the circumstances. We have to understand the famine. And in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1, we're told that to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. And if you read the entire verses there in Ecclesiastes, you'll find that not only does he talk about the good things, does he? Not only does he talk about the seasons of the blessings and the seasons when everything there's abundance and there's joyfulness, but he also begins to talk about the seasons of mourning, the seasons when things are cut off, the seasons when it seems that there's nothing being produced. And he tells us there that everything is there for a season and everything has a purpose, both the blessed and the positive, but also what we would view normally as the negative. And so we have to then take that understanding and we lay this over the concept of the famine and we understand that even the famine then, according to Ecclesiastes, has a purpose and has a season. But what is it? In Romans chapter 8, verse 28, we're told that he works all things together for the good. And a lot of times as believers, we like to understand that as the good things are working for the good, and yet he tells us all things, all seasons of your life, both the seasons of the blessings and the seasons maybe when the, th the blessings aren't flowing as much, he's working all of that together for the good of those that love him. Amen. And we find that that's a really easy verse to quote and to stand on when things are good, right? We like to quote, that's a favorite. But yet when the famine comes, can we say that he is working all things together for our good, even in the midst of this difficult time, even in the midst of the famine, are we willing to draw near? Even when it doesn't look as if the blessings are coming, even when it looks as if the promise has been cut off, are we willing to say, I'm willing to decrease so that you might increase? Amen. And so as we look at this, it causes us to ask the question that maybe if we understand the purpose of the famine, do you think that perhaps we can be better prepared and equipped for, this, for that particular season? Now, it's important to note that the times of, of famine have played a key role in shaping Israel. As we already mentioned, all of the patriarchs experienced famine. There was famine in Abram's day, in Genesis 12.10, in Isaac's day, in Genesis 26.1. And of course, we understand there was famine in Jacob's day because that's what this Torah portion is all about. If you fast forward, we find that there was famine in the days of Ruth and Boaz in Ruth 1.1. There was famine in the days of King David in 2 Samuel 21, in the days of the prophet Elijah, and in the days of the prophet Elisha, and more. And as you begin to look throughout your scriptures and you begin to look at these patterns of the famine that takes place, we understand that some of these famines were an obvious judgment from Yahweh. 
Israel was disobedient. Therefore, the famine becomes part of the judgment of Yahweh to get them back on track, to get them back to where they need to be. But there's some of these others in the days of the patriarchs, for example, that just seem to be part of the cycle. We're not necessarily given a reason. In fact, when you look at the first time you see this in the days of Abram, Abram was just obedient to what Yahweh told him to do. He goes forth and he enters the promised land. And then we're told in the statement, now there's a famine. And so we have to ask ourselves, my goodness, when I've been obedient to do what you told me to do, and I enter into these seasons of famine, what's the purpose? What's going on? Because how many of you realize if we're not careful when we enter those seasons and we don't understand their purpose, there's a chance for us to get discouraged. There's a chance for us to allow that promise, that word, that seed that he planted inside of you to lay by the wayside and not produce. And so we have to understand what's the purpose. And of course, one of the most famous ones that is often quoted in regards to the end times, it's Amos chapter 8 verse 11. Behold, the days come, saith Elohim Yahweh, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of Yahweh. And so we understand that in the end days, there's going to come a famine once again. And it's interesting because we often quote and declare, oh, we're the Joseph generation, because when the famine comes, we're going to be the house of plenty, and we're going to be able to take care of the house, and this is what this is all about. And yet we understand as we begin to look at this, if we don't understand the purpose of the famine, then we may not measure up to be that Joseph generation. Amen. And so it seems as if the famine actually becomes a time of maturation. How many of you realize you don't grow without growing pains? How many realize you can't labor and birth something or produce something if there's not that travail in order to see it come forth? And so we find that as we begin to look at this, it seems as if the house can be given a word, they can be given a promise. Israel was the chosen people. But if they're ever going to produce what Yahweh expects them to produce, there's going to have to be some squeezing. There's going to have to be some shaping, some molding, some things that are going to force them out of their comfort zone and feel those pangs in order to be, you know what, I'm going to draw near regardless and see the word that they've been given produce. Now let's look at this word for famine. It's Strong's number 7458, Ra'av, and it means famine or hunger. It comes from the root word, Strong's number 7456, Ra'ev, and it means to be hungry, to be voracious. But it's quite interesting that when you begin to break this word apart, how many of you realize that every single letter has a picture, has its own definition, its own meaning that it's lending to define what this truly means? And so when you break to apart this word, we have the resh ayin root. The resh ayin root forms the word ra. And most often we understand and we see this word translated as evil or bad. But when you really begin to look at it from a Hebraic understanding, a more accurate definition in a lot of places would be dysfunction. Something is not functioning in the capacity or manner in which it was created to, and therefore it is now raw. Now it can be extremely dysfunctional and therefore evil or bad, but it could also be slightly dysfunctional in the sense that it's not functioning at the full capacity. And there's some things, some gears that need to get in place. There's some things that need to happen in order for it to do so. Amen. <laughs> And because we understand that it's the opposite of tov, which is good. And the definition of good, after Yahweh creates everything, he calls each day at the end, this is good, this is tov. Why? Because he just created it and it was functioning in the way it was designed and created to do. Everything was doing exactly what he had designed it to do. Everything was tov. And so we find that this root, this resh ayin root, dysfunction, is connected to the letter bait which represents the house. And so when we look at the word famine, it literally seems to be inferring that the purpose of the famine, perhaps, is to reveal dysfunction in the house. How many realize the scripture always talks about that where does judgment start? It starts in his house first. And so though the famine may affect the world, the true focus of the famine and the plans of the famine is that it's going to do something inside his house. It's going to reveal perhaps some areas that maybe we're not functioning at the full capacity we should be. 
But it's not just to point the finger and shine the spotlight on that. Instead, it's to gear, it's to poke us, to prod us in order to step up to the plate and to function in the capacity we were called to. Amen. So as we begin to look at this, do you think that maybe then the focus and the goal of the coming famine of Amos chapter 8 is for the specific purpose of shaking the house in order so that that house, that people, that group of individuals that have been given a promise, have been given a word, that they'll begin to step up and begin to walk in the full power and authority that's associated with that promise and that that promise requires. Amen? And so we find that the goal of the famine seems to be from the word picture, it's a catalyst. It begins to ignite a fire in the house and it begins to jumpstart maybe some gears that have become so stuck and broken down and they haven't really been moving and he begins to oil it up and now we're beginning to move. Now we're beginning to do the things. Now we're beginning to function again in the manner that we're called to. How many of you under, realize that if we understand the message of the famine, then we'll understand why we're going through this and we'll learn to draw near in the midst of it. And this becomes the result. Because we realize that when we begin to look at the concept of a famine, we understand that the famine for some will be a season where it's nothing but devastation. There's no harvest. There's nothing being produced. But for others that understand what Yahweh is doing, it can be a season of growth and it can be a season where you actually step into the role that he has for you. Amen. And some of you may think, I don't know about that, but you're going to see, we're going to go through each of the examples and you will see that in every one of the lives of the patriarchs, that's exactly what happened. So now let's continue to look at this. We were looking at that two letter root, the Raish ayin. Well, it's interesting because this two letter root also forms the word Rea, Strong's number 7452, and it means a shouting or a roar. And it's only seen a handful of times in the scriptures, but the one that immediately leapt off the page at me is Micah chapter 4, verse 9 and verse 10. And it says, Now why dost thou cry aloud? Why dost thou rea? Is there no king in thee? Is thy counselor perished? For pangs have taken thee as a woman in travail. Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in travail. And when you continue to look there in Micah chapter 4 in the following verses, he begins to talk about the ones that have been scattered, all of Israel, and that as this, these labor pangs begin to take on Zion, it's the house being gathered. And now at the end of this travailing, it's the house that's reborn, and they're able now to come along and do what they've been called to do. And it's a power prophetical prophecy concerning concerning the days ahead. Amen. So as you look at this term, rea, this reish ayin, it's a specific cry that's associated with the laboring in order to bring forth Zion, the redemption of the whole house. And for that group of people to be capable of functioning in the way that Yahweh created and intended for Zion to function. How many realize that the Zion today, as David alluded to last week, that's not the way that he intended it to function or to be. It's missing strategic parts of the house, first of all. And so therefore, it can't fulfill what it's been called to do. And yet we find that the days of famine are going to be quite strategic in causing the true Zion to be birthed instead. Do you think that the famine has a role in birthing the house? As long as Israel does not function in the capacity that Yahweh intends for us to, how many realize that then it's as if, in a sense, Israel does not exist? If the ones that are meant to stand upright and represent Yahweh in the earth are not doing that, well, where is Israel? Where are the ones that are willing to do that? And so we find that the famine becomes quite strategic because the times of the famine are designed to launch you into the role that he declared over you. You are to be the ones that will stand up right. You will be the ones that will walk in the power and authority. Why? Because in the midst of the drought, in the midst of the famine, in the midst when there isn't plenty, when there's devastation all around, you're able to stand up and declare, even even in the midst of this, Yahweh is enough. Amen. And so we find for some, it's a season of no growth, no fruit being produced. But for those that are able to draw near, yes, it's a difficult time. Yes, it's a painful time, but it's labor pains. Something's going to happen. Amen. 
And as we continue to look at this, I decided to look at the word Zion. And it was interesting because David touched on this last week. But when I went and looked at the definition that's given in the concordances, it was quite interesting because it fits perfectly with this topic of the famine. Zion is translated, Strong's number 6726, Zion, as parched place, dryness, drought, inferring famine. And yet it's also closely related to the word Ziyun, meaning landmark, signpost, a pillar, a monument. And so when you see this name Zion, which Yahweh is declaring that this is where I'm going to dwell, this is the name of my united people, it's a people that have labored in the midst of the famine, the parched place, and because they have labored in the midst of that, it has become a signpost, a monument that gives the house direction on our journey. Amen? How many of you realize the famine is designed to steer the house, to ensure that the house will stay on course? Because it becomes the difficult seasons that you're able to look back on and say, my goodness, there's the landmarks, there's the monuments. Because, hey, remember two years ago when we went through that season where it seemed like we weren't going to make it across that season of drought, we're here today. There's one landmark. And then you fast forward, remember that season that we didn't think we were going to make it, where it didn't seem as if Yahweh was hearing us, we made it, we're still here. And so Yahweh allows those seasons of the difficult times and they become landmarks, they become monuments they become a sign that continues to steer the house, amen? That continues to remind you that whenever you happen to find yourself in that time of famine, dryness, and drought, there was one that just a few times ago was enough then and he's still enough now, amen? And so we find that these times of dryness and drought, they actually become Pivotal in allowing you to have clearer direction concerning the vision Yahweh has for you. Why? Because it's in these seasons that you're to draw near. You can be given a word, you can be given a promise, but if we don't fully understand that word, if we don't understand what to do with that promise, my goodness, we have the potential to mishandle it and it's still not going to produce until we take the time to draw near and gain understanding, gain, gain clearer vision. You can be given a word, but if you don't know how to handle it, my goodness, it may just find itself laying by the wayside. Amen. And so now we can understand, my goodness, these times of famine, maybe they're a little bit more important than we thought, because how many of us maybe have some promises, some visions that we were given, and we can look back and the sign mark, the posts, the signs, the landmarks show us, oh, we kind of handled that one a little wrong. Oh, we kind of messed this one up. And so now we enter, my goodness, now we begin to mature and we're like, wait a minute. I may be given this word, but I need to go through this season where I learn to hear, where I learn to draw near, where I learn to diminish self and what I think concerning this word and instead allow him to speak and tell me why. As we continue to look at this, the numerical value of Zion happens to be the same value, 156, as the name Yosef, Joseph. Joseph's name means Yahweh has added, increased, or will do again. Now you can understand why it is Joseph that is sent down into Egypt to prepare the way. Joseph's name literally declares that in the midst of the coming famine, Yahweh is still able to increase, to add to, and he will do it again. And because of that, Zion labors to come forth from the parched place because there was one that was willing to declare, it doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter what you feel like. It doesn't matter that the entire world may be experiencing a drought and a famine. Instead, if you can be an individual that can stand and declare, Yahweh is able, he will do it again and he will add, then you'll see something begin to be produced and it's the word that was planted inside of you. Amen? I don't know about you, but maybe that doesn't make you excited. But if you happen to be an individual that has been through that season or is going through it and you understand, my goodness, there's still hope. There's still a plan. There's still a purpose. Then it should ignite something in you because you understand this season. Yes, this season is still for your good. Amen. And we find that this shadow picture is seen again and again in regards to the times of famine. Abram goes to Egypt in the midst of the famine and he exits with wealth and status better off than when he went down. Isaac goes to Gerar in the midst of famine. He becomes rich and powerful. 
In the midst of the famine, Joseph is reunited with his brothers and saves the entire house. Due to circumstances spurred on by famine, we find that Ruth is grafted back into Israel. And when you understand who Ruth was, she was a Moabite. What was happening is that Yahweh was redeeming the wayward branches of Abraham's nephew Lot. And due to famine, those branches were grafted back in. And so we find that in each of these scenarios, the famine becomes a powerful tool used by Yahweh to reveal the fact that individuals maybe were not fully functioning at the capacity of their calling. And we find that the famine comes upon them, and in the midst of the famine, they are now launched into a position where they're able to do the plans that Yahweh has for them, and they're given the means to do so. And so we find that as we begin to look at this, it doesn't diminish the harshness or the difficulty of the famine. But how many realize it becomes a powerful source of hope because we understand there's something that Yahweh is doing in the midst of it. Abram, Isaac, Jacob were all given a promise. We're all given a word from Yahweh, but for whatever reason, they weren't quite actively doing it at the full capacity. So Yahweh allows the times of the famine to give them the means to do what they've been called to do. Amen. And so we find that the famine becomes a season where Yahweh begins to maneuver those that he's called into a position to fulfill that calling. And yet if we're not careful, if we become so focused on the circumstances and on the natural and what we feel and what we see, how many of you realize that instead of being a Joseph by our own words and by our own actions, we can actively begin to cut off that promise and that word? Because we'll begin to look at things with our natural eyes and we'll say, my goodness, nothing's producing. This is the most grievous famine the world's ever seen. There's no way we can survive this. We have no hope. It's been cut off. And yet Yahweh's trying to teach us, if you understand the patterns, the cycles of the famine, then you'll understand, my goodness, the need for a Yosef. The need for one that's able to stand up and declare, no, 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 he will add again, he will produce, he will do it, and you'll labor to see that promise produce. Amen. Now, continuing to dig a little further, the same letters that form the word ra'av, famine, if you rearrange them, it's quite interesting, it forms the word abar. And you see several words in the scriptures and in the concordances that have this same root, this ayin, bait, race root. And they all basically come together, this word family, to mean to pass through or over. It's a transition. It can also convey the idea of standing opposite or even in opposition to. And it's the root of the word Hebrew or Ivri. And so when I saw this connection, I was like, wait a minute. How many of you realize that a lot of times when we begin to define what we are, oh, we're Hebrew roots, we're Hebrew, Abraham's the first Hebrew, and we talk about, oh, it means one that's crossed over. Crossed over what? And a lot of times we look at, oh, you crossed over the Jordan, the river of judgment, and we've come out of Babylon. But how many of you realize there's also a connection to the times of famine and drought? <laughs> 